It's an article out of Breitbart, London, Enemy of the State. Tommy Robinson's new book says he believes the state tried to have him killed. And speaking of the devil, he may have to pop off for a moment with the police coming to his house just here in a moment due to some issues with the ongoing threats and the rest of it. We were just notified of that. Tommy Robinson in prison to stop Muhammad cartoon contest UK cops won't deny. And they actually came out when he went to a protest and arrested him. We have the photos and the video up on Infowars.com. Paul Joseph Watson is hosting the fourth hour today, but he'll also be riding shotgun with us to talk about this. Of course, uh, Tommy Robinson is the former leader of the English Defense League, and he is to, quote, front new anti-Islam movement. Now, he founded the group, and we have his... Um, bio right here and when it started becoming racist getting taken over he got out of it so he has the white supremacists after him and he has the radical islamicists after him he's the founder and ex-leader of the english defense league formed in 2009 since leaving the edl he has become an avid speaker on the problems of the western world and the rise of extremism islam isis hate speech and sharia and of course uh, people that try to even talk like this from the u.s and fly there like michael savage get barred from the country or from the UK. And uh, he uh, joins us. He's founded a new organization, Patriotic Europeans Towards Islamification of the West. With regards to the setting up of the group, the UK has arranged peaceful silent walk that will be held. And then he goes through uh, that coming up on the 6th of February, 2016, with 12 other European countries. His most recent book is called Enemy of the State, TommyRobinson.co.uk, and you know, Paul Watson knows his story a lot better than I, I mean, I know who he is and have followed it some, but let's go to Paul Watson first, and then he can introduce Mr. Robinson and kind of conduct some of this interview with me here today. Again, joining us from London, uh, Paul Watson. Hey, Alex, good to be here. You recommended this guest, and it's a good idea to have him on, but for those that don't know the inside baseball, break some of it down. I mean, you were just in Brussels, Belgium, where you were run out repeatedly. Uh, from areas where the Islamists were at, just in the open streets, you know, get out of here. Uh, you guys were basically accosted in Paris. I don't think people realize just how aggressive these folks have gotten uh, and the fact that uh, they are not uh, e integrating with society. Well, yeah, we visited Molenbeek in Belgium um, a few weeks ago now to check on reports that this was the jihadist capital of Europe. That's what it was called. The left for a long time, and it cropped up again recently last week with the whole ban Trump controversy, claim that this is a conspiracy theory that these Muslim ghettos where these terrorists are radicalized even exist. And in fact, Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, came out and said, these areas don't exist. I invite Mr. Trump to come over and visit, and I will walk around with him to show him that these areas are completely safe. Of course, he will. if that ever happened, he would be surrounded by... 20 news cameras and about 15 cops. So, of course, any area in that situation is going to be relatively safe. We went into Molenbeek on our own just as it was getting dark, and we were basically harassed, discriminated against racially, and chased out of there, again, proving that these uh, Muslim no-go areas... Followed by exist. cars, thrown out of restaurants, thrown out of convenience stores, could not get service at open businesses. They said, not for you, and began screaming it out. Exactly, but of course, Tommy Robinson has been facing this and speaking out against it for a lot longer than I have, so um, if you could introduce him, that would be good to get Absolutely. This Mr. Robinson, I mean, I don't know where to start with the saga that you've been through. For folks that don't know, spend the next five minutes or so uh, for our U.S. audience and others uh, exactly what you've been through. Um, so I started in 2000, and uh, in 2004, I held a first demonstration I organized when I was when I was 21 years old. That was against a group called Al Mujahideen. I'd seen them in my hometown radicalizing, recruiting. This was before 7-7, before any terrorist attacks on our shores. I started reading into this group and un understanding the ideology that has spawned ISIS. Um, I've become alarmed and concerned, so I organized my first demonstration. The response to that, as a young 21-year-old, I was attacked. My house was attacked. And um, I had to go into hiding for a little while. And, that, and five years later, um, our soldiers were parading through my hometown of Luton, 
when you talk about Mullenbeek, I talk about Luton. Luton has been named by the CIA, I believe, as the epicenter of European terrorist activity. We had the Stockholm bomber, we had the fertiliser bomb plot, the 7-7 bombers come and took their bombs from Luton and boarded the train in Luton. We've had numerous, just last week, another four Muslims arrested on terrorist plot in Britain, in Luton. So I've, I've grown up seeing the town change. In my hometown, there's 30 mosques. There's 40 to 50,000 Muslims. We're a small town. Um, I've seen the effect of it. I've had a, I don't know if you've heard of the sexual grooming, which should be referred to as rape jihad. I had a cousin who was victim of that. Um, I've, I've lived it for my whole life. Now, when the final straw was the soldiers' homecoming parade, when our soldiers were parading through our hometown and they were attacked, they were spat at, they were called butchers of Basra, baby killers, murderers. Um, one of the soldiers' mums, they spat in her face. Um, that was the final straw. Now, that, that spawned and gave birth to a group called the United People of Luton, which, which therefore turned into the English Defence League. I was 26 years old, and within six months, I was leading the biggest street protest movement Europe's seen. Um, we made mistakes, regrettably. But at the same time, what we managed to do was bring to the forefront and bring to discussion all of the negative problems that we see in our communities, whether that be sexual grooming, which had been suppressed and hidden a conspiracy of silence with Muslim leaders, political leaders, social services, politicians. They all conspired to allow and facilitate the rape of our, our youth and our girls. And for those that don't know, you, you talked about this 10 years ago, and, and now it's yeah. come out that the CPS, the police have been ordered, in the, some cases, thousands of young girls being kidnapped and raped. But because yeah. Muslims are doing it, they're, they're saying they are above the law. That's actually now, a decade after you first talked about it, that's now been proven in mainstream British news. Yeah, we've, we've been vindicated. To be honest, six years ago, politically, it was a very different landscape in Britain. When we first come out talking about these issues, we were called extremists simply for highlighting. Um, six years on, we've been vindicated, we've been proven right about everything we're saying. There were genuine concerns and fears in our community where we live, not where the politicians live, but where we live. And you're right, in one town, there was 1,400 children raped, 1,400 girls raped, passed around by gangs and gangs of Muslim men and who were allowed to do so by the police, by the council, by the government. But, and, and that there should be a warning to the world about how powerful political correctness is. That's how powerful it is. They will stand by and watch young girls be raped. And for those that don't know, in these more radical Muslim cultures like out of Saudi Arabia and other areas, women are property enslaved. Men are allowed to rape the women. And if the women speak out, they get executed uh, for being raped. So that's why you see all these imams saying, we're coming, we're going to get your women, you know, we're going to jihad them. Th this is an open tenant by you know, top, I mean, head imams in Jerusalem, Australia, it's really crazy. They actually say on tape, we're coming to get your women, you can't stop us. And now in Europe it's happening and the police are being ordered to cover it up. Uh, I mean, some oh, German towns of 100 have had 700 Islamists brought in. It's going to be much worse than England. What do you expect that to be like? Um, I've been to Germany. I've recently travelled around Europe. Meeting with, I met with Pegida. Pegida is um, the organisation that formed 12 months ago in Dresden. Um, when I went to speak at their rally, there was 40,000 concerned Germans there. Um, in some city that you talk about, in one town with a population of 13,000, they put 8,000 Muslim men, so-called refugees. In another town with a population of 3,000, they put 2,500. Overnight, their towns have been taken over. Their women are having to stay in the house. We've seen rapes from, from so-called refugees, from five Syrians in, in, in England. We've seen it in Denmark, on children have been raped. We've seen it in Sweden. We've seen it in Germany multiple, multiple times have, have these so-called refugees been raping the host nation's women. Now, this is, this is we need to realise a street-level jihad, a rape jihad, has been going on. In Britain, 90%, 90% of the street-level grooming gang convictions are Muslim men. 90%, well, only 4% of our country is Muslim. And that's not all men, but only 4% are Muslim. So say 2% are Muslim men. They're responsible for 90% of the convictions for grooming gangs. 20% of those men are called Mohammed. We have a serious problem. And, and simply what, 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 I fa what we face for sim simply speaking out, I think when people, when people listen to the full story of what we've gone through and what the state and the government and the police have done, not just to myself, but to other members and other people who have tried to voice their concerns, People will be shocked to realise that we all think we live in a democracy with freedom of speech. We think we have these, these God-given rights. We don't. You try and exercise them, you will realise you don't. And what, what America needs to understand and they need to get ready for is everything that's happening here, everything that's happened here is coming to America. I want to go to break, come back, get Paul's brief response, and then you're welcome to even ride into the next hour with him if you have the time. We have some special reports to be airing as well at the bottom of that hour. But... 
your story, you know, just, just following it is, is so over the top that in most countries you'd be considered, you know, pretty moderate, but the way they spun it, the way they infiltrated, uh, how they treated you, the way you've been arrested, where you're not even allowed to go out and demonstrate or give a speech in public. I mean, this is so draconian, but I want to ask you this question. we got about a minute and a half. Why do you think the West wants to do this? Why would they want to bring in the most radical, incompatible, pretty much dark age uh, cultures uh, to th and, and then let them have a free hand? What is the it's, point? It's complete population replacement. That's, that's what we're seeing. Look, forget the refugee crisis. If we, if we didn't have the refugee crisis, we already face drastic, drastic times ahead of us without the refugee crisis. Uh, ignore the refugee crisis. We have got Muslim ghettos across this country. We've got a population of simply only 4%, but every 10 years it doubles. Yeah, We have seen them not, not integrate, not assimilate, and that's not every Muslim, because there's some great Muslims in this country, but what we don't see integration, we don't see assimilation. We, we've had 360 terrorist arrests this year. The terrorism arrest rate goes up 60% each year. 37% of British Muslims said they wish for Sharia law. What we've seen... Um, Donald Trump getting criticised for in this country. No one's talking about the reason why he said it. No one's talking about the fact that 20% of American Muslims believe they can kill to enforce Sharia law. No one's talking about 51% of American Muslims want, want Sharia law. What is the alternative to stopping Muslim immigration? The alternative for America not stopping the Muslim immigration is you are going to end up like Europe. You're going to end up with terrorism on a weekly basis across Europe. You're going to end up with Muslim ghettos. You're going to end up with grooming gangs, rape gangs, rape jihad. You're going to end up in the same predicament. I stay only there, stay there, sir. Tommy Robinson. And what's sad is they don't want to integ uh, integrate, and they're so upset and angry with chips on their shoulders, and we're just supposed to bow down and have our throats slit. Coming up, Obama to expand modern-day slave trade with TPP. Human trafficking is actually protected in it. That's at Infowars.com. You cannot make this stuff up. One of the top Saudi princes that owns part of Fox News has come down telling uh, Trump to shut up and to get out of the presidential race because he dares to say we shouldn't allow the refugees in when Saudi Arabia will not take one refugee, not one, even though they're running the war in Syria that caused most of it. Unbelievable arrogance. Simply insane. Tommy Robinson joins us. This is a short segment, long segment coming up. TommyRobinson.co.uk. And imagine being branded like Trump as a bigot and a racist for just saying, we need to control our borders. We have serious ghettos being set up. We're being taken over. And there is an aggression, not by the first, third, fourth wave Muslims that I knew in college and high school, or really nice folks who are professionals that really wanted to come here and get away from the suppression of these countries. No, they want to bring it here and force it on you. And all these imams, we've played the clips are like, we're coming for your women. You are weak. We will take your women. It is a jihad. Your women will wear the hajib. You will submit. I mean, that's almost every day. University, you know, head professors here in the U.S., the arrogance of these people that we will usurp you. Ha, 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 you are weak. And you're like, hey, that's really, you want to destroy my culture? Yes, I will, you filth. And you're like, well, that's not very nice. Shut up, racist. Ha, ha, ha. Tommy Robinson, how? I've seen them merge with the left, though, like this mayor of London that we have a clip of that you mentioned, and, and Paul mentioned saying there are no no-go ghettos, there are no areas where this has happened, there are no... When he knows full well what's going on, what's wrong with them? And can you speak to the weird merger of the left with this? Because they, they hate the average Western male even wearing pants. They want to destroy it, but they love headdresses, mutilation, enslavement. I mean, is it a death wish? I don't know if they do love it. I think they're using it. Um, you have to remember, many, many of these hardcore left groups are communist, Marxist. They, 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 they hate the rule of law. They hate democracy. Um, they're side with anything to overthrow that. That's um, right. Probably the, the biggest the biggest option they have there is Islam. So, Because really, they hate religion too. They're, 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 so the biggest option they have is Islam. Um, when we talk about what, why is it happening and how is it being facilitated and happening, why are our government and why are our politicians yes. are politically being weak? Saudi Arabia own, I believe, over 40, 50 percent of our stock market. They own every every port in this country. They own majority shares in many of the banks, um, many of the supermarkets, many of the shopping centres. Um, they've bought their way. Simple. They've bought their way for our, our country. Um, our politicians, our political leaders, our governments have sold their soul to the devil, um, and we're left to pick up the pieces, living on the streets. And that, that's the reality of it. Let's face it. Boris Johnson doesn't live where we live. His children don't go to school as a minority in the towns that our children will. Um, what's, what's okay for him 
It, you know, we, we, we have to live with it. That's the reality of it. So whilst he was going to sit there and say how nice and cosy it is, he's not the one on the end of, uh, of genuine hostility just simply for being a white Englishman or a non-Muslim. That's the reality of it. Um, in my hometown, um, I can just, I just speak again. I don't speak about what I've read, what I've studied, which so many of these people on the left do. We've gone to university, we've got a degree, and we've read this. Well, you haven't lived it, mate. I mean, you can't read a book on building a house and then build it. I said, you have no experience at all in what we're talking about. You find in complete working class communities like where, I'm, where we're from, there's no left. There's no left wing group like this. We're all just, we all understand the problem. All of these people are living off their dad's money many of the times, their mum and dad's money and um, in trust funds and they're, they're siding. And, and it's like Winston Churchill said, the, the fascists of the future will come under the banner of anti-fascists. And he was so right. He was so right in many things he said. He also said many great statements about Islam and about Muslims, and all of them have come into fruition. We should go over some of those quotes a little bit later. Uh, continuing with the game plan, it seems people are waking up big time now. How will the controlled left and the Islamic-funded Saudi Arabian invasion respond to that? Um, what's happening? I've been saying it for six years. Well, there's a swing from left to right. It's happening. It's underway. There's no left-wing group. There's no political leaders. There's no police. There's no one that's going to stop it. It's happening. Yeah. And I, we tried with the English Defence League. We were the first people to take to the streets in our thousands. Um, and then I went, we went into Europe. We tried to branch into Europe, and we were unsuccessful. Europe wasn't ready. I've recently just come back from Germany, 40,000 people. I went to the rally in the Czech Republic where the president turned up and spoke at the, at the rally, and he gave a clear statement about the, West, uh, the mainstream media in the West. He gave a clear statement about, about the influence of Saudi. He gave a clear statement that... He's not against foreigners because there's half a million foreigners in, in his country, but he is against an ideology, ideology and a culture that will not respect his country. So things are moving fast. Um, on the 6th of February, we've organised a demonstration that's going to happen across Europe, it, it, as far away as Australia, actually. There's groups in Australia, hopefully. I'd love, love there to be a group in America that would join us on the 6th of February, but we're all going to be marching under a banner, um, save our culture, save our country, save our future. It's something that all the groups can sign up to. We've got groups in France. Tommy Robinson, stay there. Tell us more about it straight ahead. Then Paul Watson will have questions as well. Uh, Bill Cosby, just the last hour, has sued accusers. He said, you assassinated my character. Now, I'm not defending Bill Cosby, but Bill Clinton settled at least three things out of court for women that claimed he raped them, and I mean brutally. And these were in cases where it'd be a cloakroom at a party or at a government facility, he'd say, please speak to me for a moment. He'd take them into a room next to a party, grab them around the throat, bite their lip to hold them. I mean, we're talking sometimes bleeding is what they allege, and he settled that. Cosby hasn't, and I would see these women, and they'd be like, yes, I worked at the Playboy facility, and, uh, you know, I went to parties with him, you know, 20-something times, and, you know, I think he would drug me when we had sex. I don't remember it. I mean... You go up to a hotel room, you think he drugged you. This is in the 60s and 70s. You go to a hotel room. It's like Colby Bryant people. Turned out he didn't do all that. Or I mean, it's not smart if you're a celebrity, period, or whatever, to just go up with some random women to a hotel room. But then they go out with him repeatedly. In, in many of these cases, these are women, in my view that may have been abused at some level, they may have been taken advantage of, but can you say it's rape under this new feminist definition where, oh, I didn't want to have sex with you today. I mean, I did yesterday, but I was drinking, so it's rape. And the police will tell you, and it's come out in criminology now, that upwards of half or more of rape claims get reversed later and are fake. Once it gets down to brass tacks, they go, okay, I was mad at him, I just said it. And, and women need to know, this isn't just something you throw out there. Like, uh, you rape me. It's, it's despicable. There is real rape going on, and it is a problem. And let me tell you where, statistically, it's culturally accepted. And it's a fact. It is culturally accepted in the Middle East to a great extent that if a woman isn't accompanied by other men and their face isn't covered, they are fair game to be raped, period. And you bring millions of people to Germany alone who have that culture, a lot of Muslim cultures aren't that extreme. And man, they see some hot women walking along at midnight out of a bar in short skirts. 
they're, they're telling Germans nationwide, do not wear short skirts. You know, do not have Christmas carols. It may upset the Muslims. And the Muslims are saying, take it down. So with political correctness with these invading groups, they have been turbocharged with their arrogance. And going back to the founder of the English Defense League, uh, Tommy Robinson, who Watson recommended we get on, this is a guy, whether you love him or you hate him, who's been arrested uh, many times uh, and imprisoned. I mean, here's the shot of him trying to go to a Draw Muhammad cartoon uh, deal. Uh, and he was arrested. And that was in July of this year. I mean, this is not a joke. So I want him to talk about those stories, what he's been through, some of the things uh, that have been happening to him. And we go back to him in just one moment. Paul Watson, pop in uh, any time. Okay, Paul Watson and... Uh, Tommy Robinson, tommyrobinson.co.uk, former founder of the English Defense League. Gets arrested routinely for just mild political speech. Uh, he's got the new book out, Enemy of the State, that everybody should read. Okay, I'm going to stop right there and give you the floor now to talk about what you've been through, what you've witnessed, the true tyranny, not just of the radical jihad, but the left and others, the status, the globalist, wanting to balkanize society, what you've gone through, where you see this is going, and is the arrogance of the left and the arrogance of the jihadist what will finally be their undoing when their imams from London to D.C. say, your women are ours, you are weak, we will conquer you? Um, I think the biggest the biggest shock to me, look, when I started this, due to my experience in 2004, when this started in 2009, I knew full well I'd face death threats. I knew I'd get violently attacked. I knew Muslims would want to kill me. I knew full well that. Um, what I was not prepared for at all was the state. The, the state shut down, the pressure the harassment, the persecution. When it didn't work on me, they turned to my family. I'll just briefly explain. We'd started these protests in 2009, and obviously we were talking about sexual grooming, the rape of our young girls. Now, there was one police force in particular, there's, there's been a deep-held report in Rotherham, which is South Yorkshire Police Force. Now, they'd, they'd been suppressing this for 20 years. Now, I've gone to Luton Airport. I'm arrested at Luton Airport. I was due to fly to Scotland to meet up with the Scottish Defence League. This is all just in the first six, nine months of starting the organisation. I've gone to Luton Airport, I've been arrested by Special Branch. They've took me to the police station, they've done simultaneous raids. They've raided my mum's house, where my mum and dad live, and they've raided my house and my wife and children in. When they've gone to my house, they've sent armed police. They've shut the whole road off. They've spent six to eight hours in each house. They took my mum and dad's computers, they took all the phones, all the electrical devices. When I got into interview, they said I was arrested, and it was South Yorkshire Police. I was due to be talking at a demonstration there, and obviously I was going to be highlighting their failures in sexual grooming. Um, so their tactic was to come down, kick my doors off prior to the demonstration, um, impose bail conditions. I was arrested on a criminal damage. What they actually said in interview was that on a hotel room door, you've got the connecting bit, which it, which was broken, on, and I was staying in the hotel. Now, that cost £30. They had at least 20 police officers who, who, who ransacked both our houses. I was then given bail conditions for this criminal damage, not to associate or contact with three or more English Defence League supporters. The bail date I was given was to coincide with the date of our demonstration. Um, after three weeks, all charges were dropped. So I put in a complaint through the IPCC, which is the Independ Independent Police Complaints Commission, um, and it turns out that they actually had a statement from the manager of the hotel who said I had nothing to do with the criminal damage. So they had completely fabricated this to get warrants to come and basically intimidate, intimidate me into silence and persecute my family. Now... And three, they dropped all charges. Now, three months after this, and I've got that in black and white. I've got that now, in we know this is politically directed. We know it's on, this has all been all over the UK news. Everything you're saying, if you're a new listener, is on record. But did any of the police at the low level ever quietly apologize to you? Because yeah, I know yeah, that this is from higher up. So many times. Do you know what? Do you know when they come in my house? Like, after that, they come back three months later. Now, the knock-on effect the, 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 on my wife who's living in our house and the neighbours and everything like that, the pressure it brought, it, it, it was a plan, what they were doing. And that, that was to intimidate me. When that failed, they come back three months later and they come through the door again. They arrested me and they arrested my wife, who was six months pregnant. And as they arrested my wife, it was a Luton police officer, and he just said, he said, I'm so sorry. Yeah? I said, what? I said, he goes, we're taking your wife. I said, what do you mean you're taking my wife? She's six months pregnant. What are you taking my wife for? And they, they arrested her on tax evasion. They held her on bail for over three years, having to repeatedly go back. And in the end, three years later, they used her security and stability and safety of her and my family um, to blackmail me, to blackmail me into um, pleading guilty to, to an offence. And, and some people, I don't really think 
as I said, it won't do it justice explaining it now, but I can go through some of the situations. Yeah, you don't know until they've got your pregnant wife in jail and say, sign this or we're not letting her out. You don't know the pressure that puts. Pure evil. Well, it, and I, I just, I still can't believe that they've done it so blatantly. I can't believe that, as what you spoke about earlier, I was on a charity walk and I was doing a charity walk and um, the Muslim leaders had said that basically we weren't allowed to enter into the borough of Tower Hamlets, which is a huge, the biggest borough of London. We weren't allowed to walk through there on our charity walk. Um, the police arrested us. And what they did is, if you, anyone can watch this, put in Tommy Robinson charity walk yeah, on YouTube, you'll see, which is definitely two undercover police officers, they come in and they attack us. And then the police let them walk off. Here's the police. The police are at my house. One second, I'll just walk you out there. I'd be dead by now, wouldn't I? It's lucky it's a panic run. Yeah, he's got the oh. radical Muslims at his house almost every day. <laughs> Yeah. No, nah, sorry, I was just no. I'll just put the picture down and it's hit the bun. It's not a problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, yeah. We just need to have a quick look. Just yeah, you can have a look. On, on no, I'm not under duress. Yeah, yeah. It's just half of the course, but yep. sorry to interrupt. No, that's right. And that's so I've just that's a picture of my wife and kids, and because because I've got because I'm doing something online. You don't want to. I've knocked that sure down that. and it's hit. It's, it's hit. Like that button there just now. Yep. No worries whatsoever. Oh, fair Thanks a lot for coming out. Oh, no, I'd be dead by now, lads. That was about literally 40 minutes. We've just come from rocks and we've come from the other side of the Black Cat Round about down here. It's absolutely mental tonight. Like, yeah. Officers, I think last time when she pressed it was 22 minutes. Yeah. The thing is, I think just now you couldn't be any further away. You're, you're really in that isolated bit where you're. Yeah, don't say where we are. He's got a panic button. He actually <laughs> had it during the interview. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming, officers. Yeah. No worries, guys. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I'd be dead now, wouldn't I? That's, that's meant to be a panic button. That's meant to... I hope that. You know, last time this happened, my You're wife... You're not allowed to have guns in the country, I know. That's terrible. I'm not even just not allowed to have guns. I'm not allowed to have anything. Um, look, that, 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 that's took an hour. That's took 45 minutes. I'd be dead, wouldn't I? That's right. You my hit that on accident right before the interview started. My head would be off. My head would be off. Um, well, shouldn't you that... culturally let them chop your head off just to get rid of your white guilt? I mean, wouldn't that be the right yeah, thing that... to do? Maybe then I wouldn't be a racist then, would I? Absolutely. A, a dead uh, Tommy would be a good Tommy, according to some people. So, no. so uh, I mean, I agree. We don't want you dead. So expanding on this, you say the pendulum has swung. I, I want to get into that. I want Paul to uh, ask some questions as well. But continuing with all the persecution, uh, you were getting into how they allowed folks to attack you on the charity walk. And we'll, we'll show some of that on screen right now. Yeah, if you, if you actually show. So basically, we're doing a charity walk for a young, good, dying girl. Um, now, Tower Hamlets is one of the boroughs, which is a no-go zone. Yeah. So the, the Muslim leaders have come out and said that we're not allowed to enter that borough. And we're on a charity walk. We're going across London, which takes us through Tower Hamlets. The police come to see me the night before and said, you're not allowed to walk in, or, or we don't want you to walk into Tower Hamlets. And I said, they wanted me to take a 16-mile detour. Or something like that. I've only got little legs. So I was like, look, it's my capital city. And I said, why can't I walk through Tower Hamlets? And they said, well, because there's mosques. I said, I live in Luton. There's 30 mosques. What are you talking about? I said, like, there's mosques all over this country, every, everywhere. We've got over 2,500 mosques. Um, so when we've turned up to do the charity walk, as we're walking through, they've allowed two people to come into us and turn around and physically assault us. Now, once we've been physically assaulted, we don't react. We put our hands up because we know what's happening anyway. We put our hands up and they allow these police officers who, who, who attacked us to walk off. And they walk off and then we're arrested. And the, the, the police officer arrests me. And I said, what are you arresting me for? I haven't done anything. Just, we've just been assaulted. Um, she arrests us for um, preventing a, a police officer in her line of duty. They didn't just arrest us. What they did then was I was given bail conditions. I was charged. I was given bail conditions not to enter the borough of Tower Hamlets, which was enforcing exactly what the, the imam had told them to enforce. Um, and this just hasn't... This has gone on and on and on. There's so many circumstances... So they put false we charges seeing. on you on video under the orders of the imam? False charges. False charges, which were subsequently, four months later, once I went through court three times, they were kicked out. But that's not just... Um, they've done so... like. I thought everything they've done in the persecution was when I finally left the English Defence League in 2013, I thought I'd given them what they wanted. Um, they'd, they'd persecuted my family. They'd gone, I looked in their investigation, then they'd gone and withdrawn warrants on my mum and dad's bank accounts. Um, they'd arrested my brother-in-law, my cousin, they'd gone raided my nans. They'd gone basically through every member of my family. They'd gone through every tax which is it the IRS in America? They've gone through every single thing where they okay, total harassment, and then still you're not allowed to even go out in public. They arrested you this year. They arrested me this year. So I um 
I subsequently, after four years of being on conditions, I went to, I went on trial for what they said was tax evasion. They said I owed them 130. Sorry. You still right. there? Yes, we got your video back. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, they said I owed them 137,000 pounds in tax. They'd completely fabricated, and they held me on this charge for four years. They froze my assets, my businesses. Uh, before, when the English Defence League started, I had a successful plumbing business employing six men. I had a, a sunbed solarium shop in the town centre. Um, I was flying high. I had seven properties. I was working hard. Uh, they closed it all down. They held me under conditions which I believe the Labour government bought in probably for terrorists. Um, they froze all my assets with no crime, and they held me for three years. And, and, and subsequently, I got knocked And now we know that Obama ordered them this week or last week to cover up that these people were Muslim or had been trained in jihad camps and that they let her in with a fake visa information. They ordered the FBI to say it wasn't terrorism. They're, they've banned hundreds of people entering uh, the UK from the US who mildly criticize Islam. There is absolute submission and worship. I'm gonna skip this network break, it's so important. Absolute worship by the UK government and by the Obama government of radical Muslims. Why do they worship them so much? Why are they above the law? It's the, um, the influence they have. You know, like, Say, for example, in my, again, I'll bring you back to my hometown. My hometown has forty to 50,000 Muslims. The, the Labour Party get 40,000 votes. That keeps them in power. They do a deal with the central... And that's only, that's only when they're 4%. They're that powerful as a, as a block vote. It's vote bank politics. They're that powerful that they do a, a deal with a local council of mosques who are all coordinated together through one leader. Um, they've got the Labour vote. And, and, and quite frankly, we're, we're irrelevant. We're irrelevant in, in the scheme of things. In yeah, so that's numbers. it. People in old liberal republics are just out having fun, working hard, don't really organize, watching football games. And folks from third world dictatorships, they organize. They're under control of just a few leaders. They all donate large parts of the, what they make to them. Money. And uh, it's on. It's a takeover. It's a takeover. And, and no one can say it's nothing different. And what the worrying thing is, look, 4% of the country is Muslim. We really need to be thinking about what it's going to be like when it's 20%. And the, and the biggest fear, or, or I had, even when I went into prison, they, they finally got me into a prison on, on, a, on a mortgage fraud case, which was not my mortgage again. I had to plead guilty to someone else's case. I had to, if, unless I wanted to. Believe me, I know. You can put one number wrong uh, on a yeah. mortgage deal and they can throw you in prison for it. You can bounce a check they throw you in prison for it. We understand we followed form. your case. I mean, we see the videos. Yeah. You've done nothing. They arrest you. This year, you went to a Draw Muhammad contest and got arrested. No, so, so I was due to be talking at... I had a meeting arranged at the House of Lords, yeah? And it was for the 23rd of July. Now, seven days before that, the police came with no justification, no reason. They took me straight into Peterborough Prison. Um, Peterborough Prison is a prison where some... It's every prison in this country, they're like ISIS training camps. It's full of radical Muslims. I explained to them straight away what was going to happen to me. So I'm going to get killed. I've got... These are all new teeth. I've had blood clots. On, I've had a blood clot removed on my head. That when I was in prison the last time, they actually locked me in a room with them. I was locked in a room and left to get killed. I said I was lucky to come out of there, and that's happened time and time again. I'm under no. Well, describe what they did to you. I mean, did you give as good as you got? Yeah, I did. Yeah, of course. We, uh, you have to. And, and 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 even this last time, when I, when I got called in for that last eight days, I then got arrested, further arrested. So when I've gone in, I've I've said to them, I'm going to get killed in here. You know, I'm going to get killed. I'm, I've walked out on this on the wing the first day. And I've had a lad come up to me and he's put his hand over, over his face and he goes, you, you're going to get done with boiling water and sugar. Now, that's where they put boiling water, they put sugar in, they throw it in your face. It will take your whole face off. So I've looked Well, they like to do that to women. That's another thing the feminists seem to yeah. get off on. Yeah. yeah. They love and that I've looked, part. I've looked across, I've seen that, I've said, who's going to do it? They've pointed out, the, the, the lad said the Somalian, the, the lad behind the doors paying him. But remember, I'm in for eight days. These Muslim lads are in for 26 years for just killing two people. They have nothing to lose and they will kill me. So I've done the only thing I could do, which was preemptive, preemptive strike. And, um, and then I've been put down segregation. But my licence conditions finished on the, 18th, on the 22nd of July. So under no circumstances, I should have walked out of that prison on the 22nd of July. I had an event planned on the 23rd of July. 22nd of July come, I'm still in prison. 23rd of July come, I'm still in prison. They released me on the 24th of July once they'd known the date had gone. They purposely held me illegally. And this and the things that have gone on. I gotta say, a... your police are particularly cowardly and evil. That we have a lot of bad feds here in this country, but most local departments would not engage in such evil against innocent people. Uh, and, uh, and I saw them beating you up and arresting you for no reason in London. They looked like they were enjoying it. I didn't know they could pile crap that high. Yeah, uh, again, I do have to say that every individual officer I've met, even when they've arrested me, are apologetic and seem very sympathetic to what we're saying. Um, well, what about used... the ones that assaulted you? Um. 
yeah, that day, again, they're under orders. I know they're under orders. So <laughs> if I, somebody I, tells I, me to assault peaceful people, I'm not doing it if I was a cop. I know, yeah. I, 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 I'm not either, but that's because I'm not a coward. Yeah? <laughs> but at the same time, I, I wonder how many times, like even, for example, the prosecutor, the prosecutor who prosecuted me in a completely fraudulent, completely trumped-up case, that was his last prosecution. He got made up to a judge straight after that case. So there's handshakes, conspiracies. Oh, I know how it works, yeah. I, I was approached when I was in prison. I was approached and asked when I got out of prison if I'd, if I'd, re, if I'd unite the right. So for them, for them, for a, a secretive unit. In they Scotland, wanted you to be an operative to go in and run the whole show. To run the whole show. Uh, it's a secretive unit called Met Intelligence Bureau. And, when I, and I, I said, I've got no, there's no way I'm doing that. When I get out of here, I told them my plans. I'm going back to work. You've had, they had my assets restrained for four years. I said, I'm selling my properties and I'm going back to work. Now, when I got out, when I got out of custody, I'd been out six weeks. I was driving and I got arrested. I got arrested by three cars, pulled in. I was held for 24 hours. And I was interviewed on a burglary, yeah? a burglary. Now, when I got home, my wife said, Winchester Prison's been on the phone. That's the prison that I just come out of. She said, that, um, you've left some clothing there. So she gave me the number. It was an 0207 number. It was a London number. So it wasn't Winchester. I rang the number and it's, it's Ollie. So I said, hi, it's Ollie from the MIB. We, we come and visited you in, in custody. I said, yeah. He said, we can help you out with the predicament you're in. I said, I'm not in a predicament. He said, yes, you are. He said, because if, if you get charged with this burglary, you'll do eight months on licence recall. Not just will you do eight months, but the whole country's going to be told you're a burglar. Yeah? If you agree to sit down and have a chat with us, we can make that go away. And I'm sitting there, I've just come out of custody I've left the English Defence League and I don't know where to turn. And then I've, I, and because I told them my plans of selling my properties. Yeah, I you told them I'm out of this. You told them I'm done. And they're, no, no, you're going to work for us now. You're going to work for us. And then because I refused, they put the burglary charge. When that failed, and I still said, well, I'm going to have to do the eight months. But facing eight months, for me going in prison, I'm lucky I've made it out. That's the truth. I'm, I'm lucky to have made it out. But you're not going to submit. I'm not going to submit. And then, and then what's happened is I've got a letter through the post saying that they're taking £315,000 off me or I have to do five years in custody. Yeah? And again, I get contacted by Met Intelligence Bureau who say, if you agree to work with us, you don't have to pay the £315,000. I refuse it again. I tell them there's no chance. I go to court to fight the £315,000. The judge actually ruled, and this is all, as I said, this is all laid out in my book, the judge actually ruled that I have to pay the police £125,000 with no justification. No, it, well, I, look, but, when all this gets defeated, you're going to be a hero, and uh, it's just I amazing. Had pay, I, I had to sell my family house. They took my family home. Good they God. I know. Home. You've gone forever, the persecution. The good news is, as you said, you've been vindicated. The government covering up the rape of all these little girls has been covered up. The rape gangs, they are in deep trouble now. Paul Watson, I want to bring you in here with a few few comments, and we got five more minutes, then you're going to be hosting the show. And I'd like you to invite this fellow to continue if you'd like. But Paul Watson, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, all this just underscores the fact that this stealth jihad, whatever you want to call it, cannot happen without the help of the state. And I mean, Tommy explained why. They bring in this group of immigrants who are dependent on government. They're more likely to vote for big government parties. So that's the incentive for the state to bring them in in the first place. And while they're going after people like Tommy, they're also going after, you know, for example, two years ago, there was a couple, I think it was a Polish couple, that had adopted a child and they supported UKIP, which is now a mainstream British political party that is anti-mass immigration. They had that child, despite the fact they had an exemplary record, just taken from them by the state simply for supporting this anti-immigration political party. But they still failed. UKIP's now the fastest growing in the UK and Europe. Uh, they can arrest Le Pen all they want, but it's just as Mr. Robinson said, the sleeping giant's awakening. Yeah, and then you've got, you know, you talked about Winston Churchill quotes earlier. Paul Weston, a politician, was arrested on the street for reading out Winston Churchill quotes about Islam. But people like Anjem Chowdhury are free to call for stoning homosexuals to death. They remain in the country unmolested for years They're and allowed years. to say, let's kill people, but you can't march. We'll be back in 70 seconds, fourth hour, Infowars.com forward slash show. Stay with us. Simply amazing. That's just some of the news up on DrudgeReport.com and Infowars.com. And Infowars.com. Uh, we have the neoconservatives' hegemonic goal of making sovereign countries extinct. And they openly announce this new goal instead of the extinction of the planet.
And then we continue with other articles. ACO leader resigns after threatening mass murder of Trump supporters. And they were actually defending him last week when he came out and said it, but now he's been forced to step down. Uh, we have video. Look what Muslim refugees left behind on the Autobahn. It literally looks for dozens of miles like a landfill has been put there. And there's the hatred they have, screaming, yelling, trying to carjack, screaming, Allah Akbar, we're going to get you. They've been taught to hate us. Then they're brought in and then attached to socialism's m milk facility that's really our tax money. Tommy Robinson, where does all this end? You say you think the worm is turning. But, I mean, when you see the hatred of the so-called left, uh, you know, the Green Party heads in Germany saying, we want Germany to die. White people are bad. It's not, I'm not even racist. I'm not against other groups of people. I don't see other people acting like the leftist white people and then these weirdo radical Muslims. I mean, why do they want to destroy what's left of Europe? It's already collapsing. I mean, is it like a trophy they're going to mount on their wall that they destroy what their ancestors built? Is it a mental illness? Who are these freaks? Uh, they despise our history. They despise everything about us. Um, white guilt is what Europe's suffering with, and it has been for a long time, especially uh, um, Angela Merkel. And the German generation of today have nothing to feel guilty about. They should be proud of the country they live in. They should be proud of the economy, the culture they have. Um, the, the changing moment, I think, will be the first time we see a political leader elected, whether it be Marie Le Pen, whether it be Gert Wilders, who will try to enforce law. Because when they try to enforce law, by God's the Muslims will not allow them to. And that will be the moment. Um, as soon as they try to enforce any sort of laws. Because you just said it. Every time they try to enforce even arresting somebody for rape, they burn down half of Paris. That's that. Maybe it's intimidations while they're letting them do it. Maybe it's gone they, from... Go, go ahead. That, that, yeah, they are... Now it's... Um, they know what's going to happen. Like that, for example, this country, in Britain, they try, if they try to ban the burqa, Muslims will riot. They will not be able to ban the burqa. And that's just a small thing. And that's with a population of only three to four million. Now, that, that population is growing and growing very fast. And with this re re recent refugee crisis, we've seen over a million enter Germany this year. Well, when they're allowed to bring their families in the next 12 months, that'll be four or five million. Um, Europe's heading one way, and it's exactly... We're heading to conflict, unfortunately. But that conflict has to happen when we can still win and when we can still be triumphant and we still have freedom. Um, and I think what will happen is you'll, they'll wake a sleeping giant and our love for freedom will always outweigh their love for Sharia. And people will come out and they will, uh, as is growing now, what you're seeing now is just the start. It's just the start. And this refugee crisis, that's just a trickle. The whirlwind's coming. Why are the radical Muslims are taking over Islam right now, by the way, and there are other countries that fight with each other constantly. Why are they so arrogant? I mean, if I came from that type of suppression, I'd want to be in the West. Um, well, when I spent 22 weeks on solitary confinement. When I spent 22 weeks on solitary confinement, I dissected the Quran. What I did is I opened up the Quran and I wrote reference. Everywhere it said you can't be friends with Jews or Christians, I logged it down. I also made references to when it says you can rape non-Muslim women. I, I made references to that. And, um, and I ended up with 14 references for where they're allowed to, they're allowed to take non-Muslim women as sexual slaves. But I ended up with pages of references of where they can, not, where, where they're told not, told not to be friends with Jews or Christians. Now, when you're being brought up with that ideology, when you're being brought up with that shoved down your throat and told constantly how bad the disbelievers are, um, that will t that would turn to hostility. Exactly. Stay there. One more segment. Tommy Robinson, Paul Watson takes over, both from England, straight ahead, and a bunch of other news. We're back live. It's the fourth hour of the Alex Jones Show. I'm Paul Joseph Watson. I'll be with you for the next hour. We're talking to Tommy Robinson, author of Enemy of the State, about Islam, about radical Islam, about the refugee crisis. And again, let's get this clear. We're not just talking about the jihadist threat. Of course, the threat posed by Islam is not just coming from jihadists who will commit terror and violence to impose this on the West. It's coming from Islamists who will work through the political system, who will lean on governments to impose this belief system through Sharia law, which again is completely incompatible with the West, as has been proven by the Rotherham rape scandal, by numerous other paedophile scandals in the United Kingdom, which were covered up because the police and the social services didn't want to appear politically incorrect. So it's not just the threat posed by, you know, ISIS members hiding amongst the refugees. It's the threat posed by Islamists who want to impose theocracy on the West, which is bad news for secular democracy. It's bad news for women. It's bad news for minorities. And it's bad news for freedom of speech, for simply having the right to criticize a religion.
But Tommy, something that Alex touched upon before the break, we've got, again, in the UK, Muslim immigration has only increased under the Conservative government, which supposedly was put in power to stem it. But why do thousands upon thousands of Muslims move to European countries, you know, presumably to escape conditions in their own countries, to escape that low quality of life, only to recreate those conditions by moving into these Muslim ghettos and refusing to integrate. That really doesn't make much sense to me. Does it make much sense to you? It doesn't, but if you look at certain research in those countries, like Pew, the statistics of the way these people think, if you look at Pakistan, where 86% of them believe um, being an apostate should be punishable by death. You just have to look at their views on homosexuals, their views on women, all these sort of views that they're bringing them with them. They have, they've come with those views. That's their mindset. That's how they've been brought up. That's what they've had drilled into them, which is Islam, 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 um, which is incompatible with Western democracy and freedom. Those, those views are not going to work. So they've come with those views. They're not just going to leave them at the, at the door when they come into Britain. They're still going to hold those views. They're going to look up on, up on our women as filthy. I, I just bumped into yesterday, I bumped into a Luton Town football player and, 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 his, and his partner, his wife. And um, she told me the amount of times, just going to our football stadium, because our football stadium is in the Muslim community, the amount of times she's been sexually, um, had sexual remarks made her daily whenever she's there. And we, our women should just not have to put up with this. But the, it's the mindset and the culture that we're importing. And, and you're right in what you said, because my biggest fear is not groups like Anjem Chowdhury. I think they're the stupid ones that are telling us what they're going to do. The ones that are on the street corners telling us what they're going to do. I don't fear them. I fear the extremely clever ones who have infiltrated government, infiltrated political parties. We saw it with Afsal Amin. Afsal Amin was a conservative Muslim MP who, um, who actually was working, we, we found out, was a radical for 10 years, a plant within the government. Um, they're the ones I fear. And, and, and you're right. Forget terrorism. Even if you take terrorism out of the equation, the future's not right anyway. The, 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 the more Islam, the more Muslims, when Islam becomes the dominant culture in your community, we have a problem. We have a big problem. And that's not fascist, extremist, or racist in any way to say that. To say that we want to protect this country, we want to protect the Christian Judeo-Christian culture that, that, that we, we've inherited, our, our, our grandparents, um, is not racist or bigot. But in this country, even just saying that is seen extreme. And the point I've made over and over again, this is a religion that kills people who try to leave. <laughs> How is that any different from a cult? And as he said, you look at the polls, in these Middle East and South Asian countries, the vast majority of people support that belief. They're coming into the West, they're importing these beliefs with them, we're importing a real rape culture, while the feminists whine about, you know, in, in America, for example, a college rape culture that doesn't exist, it's a complete fraud. Meanwhile, the West is importing a real rape culture, complete silence from feminists on that score. But after, you know, Charlie Hebdo, there was a huge protest in Pakistan from Muslims in support of the Charlie Hebdo jihadists. So we hear this over and over again, and the left has turned it into a kind of cliche where, for example, when there's a, like a Dylan Roof mass shooting, they say, oh, where are all the moderate Christians denouncing this? And well, in most cases, they do denounce it. But for example, in Pakistan, they get out on the street, they don't decry Charlie Hebdo, they don't decry the Paris massacre, they support it. And many of the polls show that. So. What do you think prevents so-called moderate Muslims from speaking out against Islamist terror? Is it just fear of reprisals because it's basically it's a pull, or is it something more? It's a combination of things. It's a combination of things. That, look, after Charlie Hebdo massacre, 30,000 British Muslims marched through the city of Birmingham, which is the, where we're going to be holding up our silent walk on the 6th of February. They marched through the city of Birmingham demanding blasphemy laws in support, again, of Charlie Hebdo's killers. They didn't march against the killers. They didn't march against ISIS. As we've seen, they don't come out on the streets now. So it's a combination of things. It's a combination of things that I believe 30% of British Muslims felt they were justified, the killings. So that's 30% that are certainly not going to come out and protest. And that 30% are all probably related to the other ones that aren't going to come out and protest. So it's a, and then there is a genuine fear in the community as well, which is justified, because when we're talking about apostates, we've seen recently the apostate in Bradford, who's been targeted for the last 10 years. There's no charities to help these people. There's no government schemes to help people leave Islam, which we should be doing. In a similar way, we have government schemes, especially in Scandinavia, to help gang members leave the gang because they'll be targeted by that gang. Now, in Islam, if you try and leave, you'll be targeted. There should be charities, 
government support, all sorts of ways of helping these people leave that fascist ideology. We don't see it. Again, everything, every, as soon as every issue, you, you, you're on about feminism, animal rights, whenever it comes to Islam, everyone remains silent. And that simply, I think, is, is fear is paralyzing and people are scared. And to be fair, um, they've got a reason to be scared. Because the minute you do speak out, if you're in a job or career, you're probably going to lose it. Um, I'm sitting in a situation now, six years on, where they can't take anything more from me other than my life. So I'm in the situation where I'll say it. And you, you, yourself, you, you'll say, there's not many people out there. And I don't blame them because they've watched what happens to people who do, who do exercise their freedom of speech, who do, who, who do decide to criticise Islam. They've seen the backlash. It's like, for example... When I walk through my hometown and I get punched on the nose regularly or I get violently attacked, um, I quite understand that the local politician probably doesn't want to get punched on the nose or attacked every time he walks through the town. So he chooses to remain silent. Um, so it's a combination of things. It's a difficult, a difficult situation. What you actually see now in Europe is the countries that are coming out freely and talking about these issues, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, they're the countries that have not been infiltrated and infected with Islamic immigration. Uh, and and the, the influence Islam has. In our countries, when we look at previous world leaders, if we want to look at Sir William Gladstone, for example, who, who there's statues off across our capital city, he held the Quran above his head in the Houses of Parliament, and he said, there will never be peace on this earth so long as we have this book. It's a violent and a cursed book. Winston Churchill said Islam in a man is similar to rabies in a dog. He said individual Muslims, which they do, will show great, great, um, great individual... There's great individual things about about them, but the, it, the power of Islam has has the power to bring Europe back into the Dark Ages. These were world leaders. Now, if there were no Muslims in Britain and we didn't have the influence of Saudi, whoever was leading our country would be saying something similar right now. They'd be coming out saying what Donald Trump said. They'd be coming out saying what, what the Czech president said. They'd be coming out saying what the Hungarian leaders are saying. They wouldn't be accepting the refugee quotas. But because we have Islam everywhere in this country, in every political party, in every government position, in every government job. And that's only at 4%. So we really need to wake up to, to where this country's headed. And again, completely debunking this religion of peace tag. If it's a religion of peace, why do its most prominent critics like yourself have panic buttons? Why are they attacked on the street? Why are they oppressed by the government when they speak out against this? Again, it completely debunks that notion. But just in the final couple of minutes here, Tell people how they can get the book and tell people about the uh, Pegida march that's going to happen soon. OK. Um, if you're in America, it's available on Kindle. So just go on Kindle and search Tommy Robinson. Um, if, if you want a paperback or the actual book, then you can just go on my website, tommyrobinson.co.uk or the, or the British um, Amazon, and you can order the book to be within an international postage to be sent to you. Um, I think that I think Americans, when they read it, are going to be gobsmacked. I think, I think, I, I, I say actually say in the book, if there's any politician with an ounce of integrity, they, there should be a public inquiry into what's gone on with the police, with all these government agencies, with um, the, the, the state-sponsored persecution to, in order to silence me and prevent me from having freedom of speech, in order to have in a free society to criticise a fascist and backward ideology. And um, with regards to the 6th of February, on the 6th of February, we're changing very much from how the English Defence League went about our demonstrations what happened with the English Defence League, I'm not going to apologise for it because there was a hell of a lot of anger and frustration that had built up with years of resentment of being treated like second-class citizens, having our daughters or our sisters raped, terrorism, um, Islamic gangs out of control in the country. So that, that aggression that, and that frustration spilled over. Six years on, we've matured, we've grown up. We see that we want to be part of a European-wide pan, a European -wide movement that is completely peaceful. Um, so on the 6th of February, we'll be holding a silent walk in in England's second city, which is Birmingham. And I appeal to everyone to come along because you can't sit at home any longer. You can't talk about these issues. You can't moan about them in the pub. It's time to do something. And there's many people that are willing to put their life on the line. And we're not asking people to come out and get prison sentences or riot or anything like that. We're just saying, come and peacefully walk with us. Show us solidarity with us. This is so important. What's happening right now is so important in, the, in, in not just England's, not just Britain's, but Europe's future, our cultural identity, your children's future is at stake. And all we're asking is you come and walk with us for one day. Come and join us for one day and show people power and show solidarity to the other people who are putting their lives on the line across Europe to oppose the Islamization takeover.